But anyway, we have this two-edge framework, the, the now and the not yet. And so there's this uh, growing hope of the age to come. And when Jesus comes, we see in the Gospel of Mark some, some rather unusual language, and it's directly relevant to the, the message of the kingdom of God. Um, so if you want to, you can go with me to the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to look at chapter 1. This is actually one of my personal favorite passages of the Bible, even though it's deceptively simple. I think people tend to say, well, you know, there's not much there. Let's move on to, like, the more heavy stuff. But Mark chapter 1, verse 1 says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, the beginning means the initiation point. It's the, we could say, the detonation point. This is how the gospel began. And it's kind of strange if you think about it. We call it the gospel of Mark, and yet this book begins by saying this is the beginning of the gospel. It doesn't mean my gospel, meaning Mark's gospel. It's the beginning of the gospel, of which the gospel of Mark is simply one version or one recounting. It's not to say that there are many different gospels. There are some people who want to argue that. It's rather to say that there are different perspectives on the same truth, the same story, and so this is Mark's version of that. It's the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, we could ask, why would you open a book like this? Well, the gospel of Mark is written to Romans, a Roman audience, not just people who lived in the city of Rome, but who were members of the empire. And so this is the beginning of that gospel. Huh. Why would they care? Well, because to a Roman listener, the word gospel actually had a very defined meaning, and everyone within the Roman Empire knew it. But you don't. Because you live in the 20th century, not the 1st century. Because you're not a Roman, you're, I assume, an American, or at least a visitor in America right now. So you may have never heard of gospel, but in ancient Rome, when a new king, emperor, came to power, by the way, those emperors were always known as the king of kings. That's where we get the term. It's not merely that Jesus is the greatest of all kings, he is. It's, it's rather that the preachers of the gospel in the first century were trying to take the language that the listeners, who were pagans, understood and apply it to Jesus so they would have a concept. And so the Roman Empire had many sub-kingdoms among it. You had the kingdoms of the Germans and of the Hungarians and the Slavs and the Spaniards and this is all over the empire. And ultimately what, what the king of kings, what the emperor required was that they swear fealty, loyalty to him with the objective that Rome would have peace and be one integrated empire. And within that framework, there was a certain amount of, we could say, liberty given to them, provided they didn't get too far off the path and start rising up and saying, hey, we don't want to pay these taxes. We don't live, want to live according to these customs, etc. This is why, for example, the Jewish people could still have their temple in Jerusalem worshiping Yahweh under Roman occupation because the Romans were pagans. They had no interest in Yahweh at all. They didn't believe in monotheism. They were polytheists. So, and, the, and many of the things that were valuable and dear to the Jews, the Romans didn't value at all. Things like chastity. Things like not being drunk. In fact, the Romans had a god of drinking. His name was Bacchus. He was the god of wine. So guess what you did when you went to worship Bacchus? You got three sheets to the wind. And then you usually went and had sex with everybody who was at the party. Well, this was abhorrent to Jews. And the Romans thought the Jews were, you know, quaint and not really enjoying the pleasures of life. But they were like, hey, if you want to live that way, that's okay. Just keep paying us our money. But if you got to where you weren't really willing to submit to the rule of Rome, well, now things changed rapidly. And so when a new emperor, a new king of kings came to power... Whoever that individual was, that he would gather together the advisors that he had. Today we might give them names like Secretary of War or Secretary of Defense. Depends on whose country you're in. 
used to be the SecDef was known as Secretary of War in the United States. You might gather the, you know, the treasurer, the comptroller of the currency. Can we afford this? You'd gather all those senior level advisors, the cabinet. And they would gather around and they'd look at the maps. They'd lay them out on a table like this, like this wonderful pulpit. And they'd say, okay, let's look at the empire. Where are we having trouble? Ah, oh, up here in Romania. We're having issues there, so we need to do something about that. And over here, the Spaniards are not really submitting, and the English, they're not. So we're going to march the army out, and we are going to wage a gospel campaign. That's what the word was. Gospel is a military term. It is not a church term. All of us think it means good news because, you know, you can get saved. You can go to heaven. You can be reconciled to the Father. You can avoid hell. You can, okay, all of that, none of it meant anything to them in those days. Gospel meant this. There is a new king in power, and all kings that do not submit to him are about to come under the wrath of Rome. And so they would march the army out, and Rome didn't really lose much, and they would annihilate the enemy. They'd kill all the combatants. They'd take everybody else slave. They'd bring them back. They were enslaved. They'd take everything that was of value, crops, you know, things from their temples, whatever it was, and they would bring it all back to Rome, and they'd bring it on a wagon train headed to Rome, guarded by the army. And as they came down the Appian Way towards the gates of Rome, and if you walk the Appian Way in Italy today, you can still almost hear the echoes of thousands of years ago. As you come down the Appian Way, here on the left is what they call the Circus Maximus, the great circuit where they would race chariots. And right next to it was the Palatine Hill where the emperor and his family and some of the high officials would live in the nicest homes in the city, of course. They could look down on the Circus Maximus without really going anywhere, but of course they had their own private viewing stands. Today we call them, what, boxes? whether it's at the you know, baseball stadium or the soccer stadium or the football stadium or whatever, you paid a premium for these. Well, they, they had that too. You, today, you can walk the Circus Maximus. It's open to the public. I shouldn't say this, but I have a piece of marble that I happened to find lying there, <laughs> put it in my bag and brought it home. But, okay, so that was that, and then you had the Palatine Hill, and <clears throat> later in the history of Rome, over here on the right, you had the great Colosseum. And directly ahead of you were the gates of Rome. And they would send the runner down the Appian Way, and he would say a message. And now this runner, this runner was a herald. He was a proclaimer. He was a preacher. <clears throat> and he ran ahead of the returning army, loaded down with riches and slaves and all the spoils of war. And he was always taken from the signal corps. Now, the signal corps was used to carry messages between units of the army with the idea that they would be coordinated on the battlefield. So you had to get the message right. You had to be sure that you were sure that your signalman was not miscommunicating because if you said, well, this unit goes this way, and you wanted the other unit also to go this way so you'd maintain a consistent, unbroken line of soldiers, that's a good thing if you're fighting. If you tell this piece to go that way and this piece to go that way, you've just opened up a breach in your front lines. The enemy comes through, divides the troops. That leads to defeat. So consistency of message was a critical part of what the signalman carried that's true for us today. We are called to be preachers and proclaimers of the gospel. If we diverge from the kingdom message, if we diverge from the true apostolic gospel, bad things will happen. This is part of the weakness in the modern church today. So I'm just trying to draw us back to a consistent understanding here. All right, so now this signalman is at the head of the Appian Way, and he comes, he, he's running down the Appian Way, and he passes the Circus Maximus, he passes the Palatine Hill. If it's later in the empire, he passes the Colosseum. He gets to the gates of the city. The people are awaiting the army. They know the army is coming back. They can see the dust cloud behind them for miles as they're coming, and he comes with a message, and he says this, Citizens of Rome, let me tell you the gospel. There is a new king in power, 
and he has fought a battle on your behalf. Now partake of the spoils of a war which you did not fight. And all the people of Rome would say, Hail Caesar! Hail the King! All hail King Jesus! That's how we take it. That's a very different understanding of gospel than what we teach at church camp or Sunday school. This is not be nice. This is the king has come to bring about the subjugation of those that are in rebellion against him. And most particularly, this is demonic power and sickness. And this is the beginning of that invasion. Gospel, a good term to substitute for gospel, is invasion. God's invasion. That's what we are about. 